uh, education committee meeting. Uh, please join me in the pledge. <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Upper Public Meeting Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and attend the meetings of the public bodies of which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Federal Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof distributed to the persons on the approved list posted in the Board of Education Administrative Office and sent to the Bergen Record and the Star Ledger. The announcement posting for the Education Committee, along with the date, place, and time thereof, was distributed on January 15, 2018. And there's no closed session or anything. Um, the purpose of the meeting tonight is um, really an exciting time for um, Fairlawn schools, and we are going to be talking tonight about bringing back the house system to the middle schools in town, as well as a brief overview of what's in the works with the schedules a little bit. In a couple months, that's going to be more of a, more of a topic um, once that process is uh, further along. So, Natalie, it's all yours. Thank you. All right, so good evening. Or Dr. Lacatina. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, as Mike said, what's that? Don't go like that. Don't raise your hand. My mother would say, yeah, don't do that. Um, so tonight we're going to start off with a preview of the scheduling that we've been taking a look at so far this year. So we have Elliot Marenbloom that has been helping us take a look at our elementary schedules as well as our middle school schedules. As you can see, we've had several meetings with Elliot in a variety of ways, sometimes with just administration, sometimes it's been with teams of teachers, some of whom are here tonight, um, and other times um, it's been more, again, just the administration or central office. So we've met with Elliot a great number of times and it is amazing to watch his mind in action and how he puts schedules together. Uh, so basically what he has done for us is he has helped us take a look at our elementary schedules and there were several things that we really wanted to tackle when we're taking a look at the structure of our elementary schedule. One is consistency. Obviously we've had that word in a lot of different areas in district for the past two years about making things consistent from one school to another. So one thing we wanted was consistency. We also wanted equity. So not all students got the same experiences such as the specials that were given to them and provided to them. And same thing for teachers. So teachers did not always have the same preparation periods as one another. So we're trying to make things equitable in our schedule. We're also trying to build in common planning time because again, we know that we need to give time to <coughs> teachers on grade levels to work with one another, plan with one another, and it benefits the children. And the last thing we wanted to take a look at was an intervention. Uh, we have many types of intervention that occur during the course of the day in an elementary school. Basic skills math, basic skills reading. We have OT, we have PT, we have speech, we have reach. We have lots and lots of things that we have to try to find time in the schedule for our students. And oftentimes it's, well, what are they going to miss in order to be able to get those interventions? We don't like them to miss anything, but the reality is our day is stuffed in elementary school. And it is very difficult to find that time. So thanks to Elliot, this is just a sample of what our proposed framework looks like for elementary school. So let's pretend that this is a third grade schedule. First of all, every grade level now has this, a homeroom identified. We have a 10 minute homeroom. In elementary school, there's a lot to do. You have to take lunch orders. It can take a kindergartner 10 minutes to take a coat off. There are lots of things we need to take care of in an elementary day. And then, if this was a third grade schedule, every third grade teacher would teach math during this time frame, including our special education resource teachers and any inclusion teachers. 
So we have taken this schedule, we have lined it up not just for the teachers on the grade level, but we've also aligned it with all of our special education services as well. Then the next period, um, they will do social studies or science in the elementary school. We do cycles, so instead of teachers prepping two days for social studies, two days for science, we decided we were going to do units, six-week units, approximately all social studies, and then we're going to go to science so that the teachers and the students can focus on just one of those subjects. We've been doing that for quite some time. And then you'll notice there's a tech class in here. So for every teacher on this third grade level, one might have tech on Monday, the next might have it on Tuesday, the next might have it on Wednesday. But they're either teaching social studies, science, or tech that period. This I stands for intervention. We now have an assigned block of time in which we are going to offer intervention services to our students. So if I need some intervention, I might go to speech on Monday. I might go to math on another couple of days. So we are going to try as much as possible to pull our students for those intervention courses in this intervention period. ELL takes place here, English language learners um, go for their classes here as well. And then we all go back to homeroom for a couple of minutes. We set up the gym, we go to the gymnasium for lunch, all those students would have either lunch or recess half an hour for both. Then you can see we have a long block of time for English language arts. And then the last period of the day for this particular grade level is their specials. They get two phys ed a week, one music, one art, one world language. And this rotates depending upon the teacher. But this obviously is the common planning time. So in essence, every teacher on that grade level would have a prep on this, this period every day of the week. So what this does is we took our whole entire day, divided it into time modules, equal time modules, and then you will notice that some classes have double modules because according to our elementary time chart, for example, we spend 70 minutes a day on math. So we put two of these modules together to make sure that the students get the required 70 minutes of math. So that is a sample of what an elementary schedule looks like. And then we have to obviously get into the real details in every building, and they are quite far along, where they are working out this schedule for every single teacher. There are some times, because of space, that we might have to put one of the PEs here and move the tech into this rotation. It would still be a free period, but we sometimes had to just flip flop because of facilities or things like that. So we have found so far that we have at least three common periods a week. We're trying to get five. It has not always been possible because of things like facilities, the use of a gym most, mostly. Um, and so we are thrilled with this because this really meets all of those goals that we had to be consistent. So every K through five student, every K through five teacher would have two phys eds, one music, one art, one world language, one technology class. Question. Right. Is that for all the elementary? Is that all the elementary. We'll be on the same. We all have this same and, template. And like on Monday when you have phys ed, um, all the third graders will be in phys ed. No, so one third grade class would be in PE. Yes. And another class on Monday might be in music, okay. and another okay. one might be in. Oh, that's what I was asking. Okay. Yes. Like I get all those things. Yes. I think Jeff had his hand up next. Um, a few questions. If a schedule, someone had this schedule, that's about two and a half hours without a break in the morning. Um, what is? I know there are other people can answer the, the, this question here, but is there any contractual language that would prohibit us from? not allowing that teacher out of the room for two and a half hours or that, so, that's a that's a long haul for any teacher and I don't know if kids are going to get the best out of those teachers well that's why we love this because right now the contractual language and you can correct me if I'm wrong two hours a week that is all it says about elementary teachers and I can share with you that we have elementary teachers right now that don't get a prep on a given day they might have two days where they don't have a prep so they teach all morning, have lunchtime as a break, and then no break again in the afternoon. What this does 
is this ensures every teacher a break every day. <coughs> and so that is something, that is an improvement okay. over what we this currently have. Um, if I could, what I think Jeff doesn't realize is that elementary people don't have a schedule like high school people. Correct. I get they that. have but always been all morning in a classroom and all afternoon in a classroom. That, that's, that's common. Yeah. Right, just for cool. elementary level. <laughs> that's where you see. That's why you see all the mugs and stuff that's about about having to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what what we like about this truly, and I know what you're saying because it is difficult because our elementary teachers are in one room. They don't get that that movement, right? That some other teachers in a middle or a high school might have, uh, which is why we make sure with kids we do things like brain breaks. Um, and we do things that require movement and you're constantly changing from one thing to the next because we understand their, uh, their, uh, oh my goodness, attention span. <laughs> <laughs> their attention span is always, that was a very good model. Thank you very much. It isn't always that long. But this assures us of a break every day. And this is just one example, um, but it really does help our elementary teachers and our students. Okay, I, I Hold on question. one second. We're going to do board members and I'll go to the public. Okay. I, um, in terms of just the science social studies, mm -hmm. it seems obviously we're very focused on just math and ELA and we're not really that focused on social studies and science and it seems that was a decision made of, of a priority in that case. Um, <laughs> I'm not really allowed to judge that, but I'm worried that, you know, what times do they have that to do like more practical things like science labs and things like that with, the, with the, such a short allotment of time? That is built in and again our science program is all hands-on so it's very hands-on our program. Um, so they don't do labs it's necessarily in the sense that our you know, middle schoolers and high schoolers do um, but it's a very inquiry based program and they do a lot of hands-on work within the classroom. Um, and our students have always done really well in science. Um, this is a model that's been in place for years and years. Um, so I don't like to say we don't focus on social studies and science. Um, ELA and math do become a major focus in elementary school. And, and that would be pretty typical. Okay. Mark, Mark yeah. yes, I wanted a question about the required amounts of time for subjects. So for instance, P, P8, that was always 150. 50 minutes required time. So how are they getting the other? PE and health. Yeah. And so some of this time here is going to be social emotional learning pieces, which bring in some of the health concepts. Which time? In homeroom? Yeah, like this additional 15 minutes. And we also have some health, we also have some health topics that are in our science curriculum as well. So it's going to be sort of integrated. The other question is with science and social studies, there are also required amounts of time for that. So how are you fitting all of that in? What, in, in other words, what is the requirement now for social studies as required by the state in the amount of time? I don't know if they have a required amount of time by the state for social studies and science. No? I don't believe so. Is that count? I thought it was, okay. I thought, I thought there was. Yeah. The other, the other question is, in order to fit, or maybe you answered it with the homeroom, but you're taking away the 10 minutes at the beginning of the day and for the homeroom, basically, and you may not be doing all of uh, health and, and so forth. What is actually being removed in order to compensate for all the time that you're giving now? Uh, there was a great deal of transition time that was built in that we are giving back across this. And there were often times where our first class didn't start until after 8.45, depending upon how the special subjects were scheduled in each of the buildings. So we are really very good with our time. It matches what we have on our elementary time chart. This is the only piece that is new right here. A lot of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, just this piece. All right. And, and the last question that I have is usually the special area teachers are the ones who are providing the prep time for the teachers. They are. That's so correct. the question I have is are any of these special area teachers free above and beyond 
I, I guess they're required one period of free time per day? <coughs> so that's exactly what we're trying to do for our special teachers as well. And we don't have all of those individual schedules yet. So I think what you're asking is, so right now if you look at, a, say, a classroom teacher, they have six free periods a week, right? So they have these five and then this one. So are you asking if a phys ed teacher might have more than six, or an art teacher might have more than six a week? Is that what you're asking? I'm, I'm asking that if there's eight periods a day, mm -hmm. and the phys ed teacher is supposed to get one free period of time mm -hmm. that day, are they actually ending up, because of how the schedule is built, are they actually ending up with two, maybe three periods of free time that day? And how are they going to be used if they aren't? Right, typically not, um, typically, we try to fill their schedule, but we don't have all those individual schedules yet. Um, so what's happening is the elementary principals are building their own schedules, and then we have to come together because we share personnel. <coughs> so then we have to figure out how to share, say, a phys ed teacher between Lincrest and Forest. And so then we have to tweak schedules yet again to make sure that they have chunks of time in one building and then chunks of time in another. And we also have to build in travel time contractually. So. Elementary scheduling is a challenge every single year. Having a framework is actually helpful because then at least we know that every school is starting their classes at 848. Whereas sometimes, as I said, in some buildings, they might have a prep that first chunk of the day and they didn't start till 910 or something like that. So it makes it easier for us to share personnel now if we're on the same schedule. It makes things very consistent, um, which is something that I think we've been looking for, and I think something that um, the association has been looking for as well. Okay, great. So, um, I have a couple questions. So, um, you said for the I time mm -hmm. um, that kids are going to be pulled out for interventions that mm -hmm. are specific to their needs. Mm -hmm. For students who don't need that intervention, what are they going to be doing during that 35 minutes? Wow. So that's, that's a great question, and those, we are still in conversations about that, because what will happen is on certain, we don't know yet on any given day how many students are going to be left in that classroom. So there's the possibility, again, if we have three third grade teachers that are still left, we might be able to divide students up into groups and provide some additional support, some additional, um, I don't want to say enrichment, but extension activities. So we are still talking about that because that is something that we've, we've never had before. And so we're kind of excited to have that, that time. So yes, we still are working on some of that. Okay, and um, for the teachers who have the specials in their classrooms because there's not space for um, the kids going to a music room or an art room, mm -hmm. how do they use that? Time. Right, do they just same way that they use it currently? Yeah. So many of them stay in their room and work on their computer and get things done. Sometimes they go to the faculty room and sit in the faculty room. Okay. So it depends on however the teacher feels comfortable and doing that. And does it help with that? Like in Mills, Warren Point, Bradburn, where they're short? That this schedule that does not with? address room so, space. No. Okay. okay. So we can clear that. And yeah. then um, one last question as a follow-up to so there's three modules for English and language arts and two modules for math and kind of a rotating module for social studies and security science. Correct. Is there ever discussion of a more um, stepwise approach where like a, like a kindergarten schedule might look like this, but as kids get closer to fourth grade and prep for the transition to middle school, they might have a longer science period or a longer period? So right now kindergarten looks very different than this okay. because kindergarten has their choice time at the end of the day and they have phonics modules and things. Within this ELA it might look different the amount of time that goes to a, a study, uh, work study or you know readers, writers workshop. So sometimes that changes depending upon the grade level. The other piece about a schedule like this is if there is, let's go back to Jeff's um, idea of what if you have a longer lab that you want to do in science. Because all the teachers on the same grade level are doing the same thing, they can decide to sort of extend into another module on either side. Um, so they can do those things when it's necessary. 
Okay. So like if the fourth grade teachers wanted to do an extended science module, they could, they could find the time sort of because they're all doing the same thing every day, every period, it makes it more flexible. And with that, they'll have the flexibility to um, just to do those things or so they would have to ask permission for that. No, they don't. I mean, we trust that they're professionals, and so off. Yes. <laughs> um, any other board members? Any questions? Anybody? From the audience? Um, I have a question. It's, it seems. I mean, we were concerned about teachers having a break. What about the kids? I've only seen one break a day, and also is. Three minutes enough between each. Well, they don't really switch classes, I so know, that's but there. But it takes ten again, minutes to put the this, quotes. But this is nice. very much what our schedule is now. They still only have one, sometimes less than one, special a day right now for the children. So what I say about teachers is true, right? So um, right now, our children are not guaranteed to have one of these classes during the course of the day. They're not guaranteed that right now. But what we're proposing is that they will have a break during the day, every day. So this is an improved schedule. But it still doesn't solve the problem that they only have the one less than, they have half an hour of break for a full day. That's the way that it currently is. Um, and and so basically better. what we, well no, because we don't have a half hour break every day for every child. That's not the case right now. So there, is, there are classrooms where the children do not get a, an official break. Understanding, our teachers are very capable. They do brain breaks, they do movement stuff. There are, they are never sitting in a chair from 8.30 in the morning until 11.15. That's just not the way that they instruct. So there are opportunities, they might not go to an art class, but there are lots of opportunities for movement and group work within the classroom. So again, the goal. This is the goal to have from 8:35 to 3 p.m. to have half an hour of break for the kids. This is one example. Okay. This is one example of what it might look other? like. Uh, now these these are. This is it. You've got these five and this as official times when the children will have those other courses being taught by a different teacher. I'm talking about a break. The kids to. Well, just, as I'm saying, we do things called brain times. breaks. They go out and at movement. Lunch. They go out at lunch. They have recess. It's half an hour on uh, from 8:35 until 3 p.m. And they have a half hour break here. That's it. That's and then they have done. another half hour, 35 minutes. This is the way it's that our schedule break. is. How long is lunch? How long is lunch? An hour. Thank you. So you have 30 minutes of recess and 30 yeah. minutes. Of yes. Oh. Yeah, no, I just had a question about the beginning of the day. Is, is, is the bell system going to change? Because my recollection is, and well, I guess not recollection, I know that 835 is the first bell, and 840 is the second bell. Um, kids being kids, by the time they get in there, they're like 10 minutes of the map. So this, um, we don't, those are our only two bells that we have yeah. until lunchtime. Sure. No, no, <laughs> so I know that. Bell, so no, those I'm just will saying remain that, our bells. Like, like so that, is that whole time like, realistic? In yeah, so we time. want them in by 8.40. Yeah. And then, so 8.45 is what we're really aiming for. Actually, 8.48, so there's a couple extra minutes there. Um, so we are hoping they've got to get, again, younger kids. Yeah, with the carpet time and going, time. Through their, yeah, going through their whole routine that they do in the morning and that kind of thing. So yeah. that's why places like kindergarten look a little different. Sure, 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 sure. Um, but, you know, we know that children, especially the younger ones, it takes months to get into a routine. Sure, sure. So while you have these lovely modules that you hope to stick to, in the younger grades, it's <coughs> going to take some time, realistically, to get them to be within these time frames. And we expect that, and that's part of what we teach them. We teach them routines yeah, and yeah, how to yeah, do exactly. that. Yeah, and sure. so if you looked at a kindergarten class in September and you looked at choice time, let's just look at choice time because it's more free time. Sure. They get to choose where they want to go. Yeah. Half the time for in September, we're just teaching them how to go to a group, what their choices are, how to, what do they do if they go to a group and it's already full. So by third grade, you think that they're they're kind of oh, yes. get, getting in and getting going. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yes, by third grade, they're really good. they're quite good. So this is a sample. Are there other samples? And then once 
it then does the board vote on what they think the best route is? Is that how it works? So we don't have other samples. This is to show you the framework. And so what would change is just the order that these modules were in. So that would be the difference. So this is our proposed framework. So that template <coughs> will stay the same. And then this stuff in between will move where the ELA might be in a different period and math might be in a different period, et cetera. So, you know, third grade might have their specials this period. You know, kindergarten might have it this period. So each time module during the day would have a different grade level assigned to it because of facilities. And the board votes on that um, X date? Um, or, or it doesn't work that or it doesn't work that way. Just goes they the don't place. they don't typically okay. approve every teacher's yeah. schedule. Oh, no. Okay. No. Other other math? Okay. Oh um so because there's no bell schedule, mm -hmm. um, and some of the times are a little bit unusual, like a twelve twenty one or one oh six, is there sort of time built in, let's say if you miss it by five or six minutes for each teacher? So again, it's not built in, um, or it's not that flexible if you're going to say another teacher, right? So if this teacher runs over, and this is the way it works now, we have no bells in the elementary school. So they have to just keep track of the time um, by the clock. So if this teacher runs over a little bit, well, their children are gonna get to that class a little late. But let's say, um, let's say here between math and social studies, if that math teacher runs over five minutes into social studies, well, that's her own period. It's her own class. So she would just be five minutes later moving into her social studies or science. So does that make sense? They're still fulfilling their obligation time. Lapse. Absolutely. Okay. And, you know, our elementary teachers do a great deal of cross-curricular work. I mean, they do. In order to get every science concept in and every social studies concept in, we have leveled readers in our reading groups. So in reading, they're reading about what we need to know in science and social studies because that's how we have to fit those topics in. So we have leveled readers on those topics. We talk about those kinds of topics in other places throughout the day, but it's incorporating science concepts into a reading lesson. <coughs> so the lesson is on reading, but they're using the content of science. Thank you. Yeah. So um, two things, I'm also very concerned about the lack of recess time and, and not even, you know, go choose, you know, kind of a, a, a framed selection time, but just mm -hmm. free time to the kids, you know, to interact with each other and, you know, not just during the half an hour lunch. Um, and the other thing that I want to ask about is the intervention. So what was that based on? What, what need came? What, what uh, information did we gather that? So we have children that have a variety of opportunities available to them and also children that because of an IEP or a 504, um, they require some extra services. So we have students right now that we try to figure out how are they going to get some additional supplemental help in reading and in math. Then we have children that go to speech instrumental music lesson, speech lessons, reach. They get to take enrichment. Uh, so we have all these areas, our students that are English language learners. And what happens is because of the way that our schedule is, a child might miss math to go take an instrumental music lesson. And then the child misses the instruction and has to make it up. And that's the case with all of those things I just named. Scheduling becomes a nightmare, <coughs> quite literally, in all of the elementary buildings. And so what this does, it is this allows the majority of those events to take place when they're not missing instruction and they don't need to make it up. And so that is a huge driving force because it is much better for the child to obviously be there during the instruction. And, and there are some students that might choose to not want to go for an instrumental music lesson or might not want to do something because they're afraid to miss what's happening in the classroom. So um, th that's great. My, <coughs> my other um, ask, I guess, would be that for those students who don't need the enrichment, do they have you know, advancements kind of helping them where they excel? Well, and those are the things we're going to talk about so for students that might be left in that room. Okay. And that's the beauty, again, if we have two, three, or four teachers on that same grade level, 
and we look at the needs of the children, we can have one teacher doing one kind of activity one place and one teacher doing something else in another space. We just, we have not finalized any of that yet. We are still working through to make sure that this actually works in every building for every teacher. And it, it's a process. May I add something about like Please. that literacy block? I think it's important, I'm the science supervisor for the district. Um, I think it's important to understand that although it looks like a middle school schedule where you have period five, period six, period seven of like <coughs> literature, for example, that's that's not how it works in elementary school. You'll you'll have the students gathering in a circle, listening to the teacher read a story. Then they might go back to their desks and write, or they might go quietly read for a little while. It's the, that block is very broken up into, and again, I'm not an expert in that. Gary could speak to it better than I could, but, but it's but not, you're like, right. it's not it, like the teacher standing in front of the room and right. lecturing for that whole time. Which is why I was trying not to call them periods, and was trying to call them time modules. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know yeah, it's yeah. semantics, but we don't have periods in the true sense like we do in a middle school, where it's, you're there for 42 minutes, bell rings, and you are gone and out the door. Natalie, correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> What this schedule is doing is it's taking what we're doing now, for the most part, mm -hmm. adding a couple tweaks like the intervention period, yes. and making it actually more effective because and more equal throughout all the schools. So the children are doing this now, Absolutely. and for the most part, excelling at yes. it during the schedule. Mm -hmm. So this is this schedule just makes everything equal and just makes everything kind of come together. That's the way, that's the way I'm looking at it. it. Absolutely. It does provide the equity for students, for teachers. It provides consistency. Um, and it, it really, it, I think it benefits everybody. This is so much better than what we have currently been working with. It really addresses a lot of the concerns that we have had. Mark? Oh, sorry there. Continuing with what uh, Ron was saying, Ronnie was saying, sure. the ELA, ELA uh -huh. there are going to be literacy centers there, correct? So we have reader's workshop, writer's workshop, word study, phonics, spelling, and upon the grade level, they are all mixed up <coughs> in there. So literacy centers, if you could define that's them. What, that's yes. exactly what I was saying. Yes. Are there requirements as to the length of each one of them? Absolutely. It's part of our elementary time chart that we've had for years. Okay. So, so during that time, they are also getting up and they're also moving around and Always. doing things and not sitting in front of a teacher. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. Mary, Dr. Palestis, then Emma. Oh, so, so two for us. One, I, I think in, in addressing this gentleman's concern, built into any larger time module are these, these are shorter blocks of what's going on so that children are moving, children are regrouping, children are w walking around. So it's not like recess out in the schoolyard, which is running wild, <laughs> but, but it's lots of breaks for the children and lots of changes for the children, and the children don't feel exhausted. The second thing was, now you correct me if I'm wrong, based on what Mike had said, for the teacher's point of view, from the teacher's point of view, this is now finally providing that big key of the common planning time, mm -hmm. where, um, because we have our PLCs, our professional learning communities, but when teachers have the opportunity to come together and to work on the science uh, unit or whatever, um, you know, the, the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. And so this is really, and plus what I see doing is I see definitely more minutes of planning time here built into this schedule, which has long been a bone of contention, I know, for the elementary teachers. So there's a lot of really good things coming out of this particular uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ballistas. I just wanted to add my perspective, having served as an elementary school principal previously. And one of the very clear 
observations that I had when I first arrived in the district last year is that our elementary schools did not have consistent schedules. That's a very, very significant factor for us as we go through this, because when schedules differ from building to building, that means that students are getting a different program from building to building. And so what this does is it addresses the consistency and so Natalie used the word framework, that now the principals and the teachers have a framework to work within. And it is equitable. All of the students in all of the elementary schools are going to get the same basic program. I want to add as well to what Mary just said about teacher prep time. So if you go back a year or we look at this school year, if teachers do not have common preps, then they are either staying after school, which I know is the case, and they are <coughs> meeting after school to pull together lessons. But when teachers don't have common preps on the same grade level, the grade level content can go in different directions. So you have a consistent schedule now, and the most important component, I think, in my mind is that now teachers can sit side by side and plan grade level lessons. So we want all of our students on the grade level to have the same kind of experiences. And we also in the district value the idea of teacher collaboration. This opens up all sorts of possibilities so that all of the teachers can meet with the principal at the same time or they can meet with one of our subject matter supervisors. So it's innovative, but despite that, really is not that different than what we're doing. But it gives us the consistency. I think it gives our teachers a significant edge. I really love the idea of providing the, the opportunity in the middle of the day to do the interventions. And you know, what's very important is trying to eliminate during a school day instances where we are pulling kids out. And I've always thought that if we have to pull a kid out of math to play clarinet, then what happens when they go back to math? They have missed something, no matter who that child is. But the more that we can use the intervention time to take care of the gifted kids, the kids who need reinforcement, the ELL students, the kids who are going <coughs> for music, that is going to help us organize their day so that the basic core instruction is being provided by the homeroom teacher and they're not being forced to make up anything. I mean, that's the beauty of having that in there. It gives us opportunities to do a lot of individualization. And our teachers do that now. They do the best that we possibly can now. Uh, I like the schedule. It solves the issues that, that you originally presented at the very beginning. Emily? Uh, so I wanted to get back to that intervention time, and I just <coughs> strongly encourage to stop calling it intervention time and call it something that's more encompassing for all students so that it's not like, oh, these students are getting intervention and these students are getting who knows what. You know, maybe it could be called individualized learning time or personalized learning time or choice time. And reflective <coughs> of the diversity of what parents want for their young kids in our district, it might be a real opportunity if feasible, and I'm not the expert on this at all, but just and I brainstorming ideas to um, see if they're feasible, is to give parents and students some choice on how they want to use their time. So for example, you could have um, a robotics session, you could have a yoga session, you could have extra recess time, you could have um, personalized learning on, a, on iPads, and maybe there's, you know, certain, for each quarter or marking period, the students and parents reassess it. So that can accommodate some of the, the real thirst for more choice and to, for, for students to be able to select into opportunities that are best suited for them and to also make school a little bit more pleasurable than just kind of how like traditionally school has been for all of us, mm -hmm. um, while really meeting the needs of all students in that time too. I would just hate to see the 35 minutes become um, study hall. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not even just like a, a neutral period, but it's actually it could be a missed opportunity to do something really innovative and great for all students during that time. Thanks, Brian, to say something. <laughs> <laughs> and Twitch, uh, there's endless possibilities. Yeah. This is 
this is, we're very, very excited about the intervention. <clears throat> Hard press. But, but something time, whatever. Slash that individual time. learning group. Uh, ro I, I was trying to write down as fast as I could, but we have to pay. Uh, there are um, endless possibilities for that block of time. Uh, there is, this is what every school, what every teacher, what every administrator yearns for. To have a block of time where you could provide something. Whether it's intervention, whether it's to reach students that excel, um, personalized learning, as you had said. This is, this is great. I mean, and I, I think you're going to see probably a lot of what you were saying and expressing, but, um, you know, it's just, this is, this is, this is exciting stuff right now. To have that one. And I think it's a good point because if you've heard some of the things that happen in that period, they're not necessarily interventions. Some of it is choice. It's a choice to be part of some REACH programs. It's a choice to be, it's a choice to be taking an instrument, right? So, so it probably is a misnomer. Um, so. I like I like very much. The, I'm sorry. The personalized learning. Yeah. Keep in mind that that was one of our components of the strategic plan. But I'll give you a good example of some elementary schools that have been in uh, students. One exa a small example is something called Genius Hour. So if you're familiar with G what Genius Hour is, it's a, it began in the world of Google, in which anybody who was an employee of Google was allowed to spend some of their time on anything they wanted as long as it had something to do back with Google. And then somehow that spread from <coughs> the corporate world into the schools. And then it has become very, very, very popular because kids can work on projects, they can work with groups, they can work individually, they can do a lot of follow-up. Uh, but I like the personalized one. I think that Intervention tends to have a more narrow focus and personalizes something that we've been talking about. And it has all positive connotations. So that might, you know, maybe we think about that along the way as well. Natalie, correct me if I'm wrong. You would never call it. I really it, have to correct people. You, you would never call it intervention. <laughs> like, no, it, like and, the, the and the kids do it. Yeah. Granted, once they get up toward middle school, they know where the kids are going, but I, if I'm not mistaken, in, in elementary school, they don't really, if, so they don't know where kids are going. There are so many oh, reasons that students go in and out right. of elementary that, I mean, I think it's tough enough for the teacher to keep track, let alone the students try to figure out where right. people are going all day, so. Uh, all right, uh, we've got okay. Rob. Uh, I have well, two things. One was what Emily had said. I, I wasn't crazy about the intervention and where there are other opportunities. The other thing, the other question I have is the world, that's world language at the end? That's correct. Um, no, correct me if I'm, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not you, but I don't know if I'm true, but are they learning that in social studies, like world, or is it just, so what's world the, language, what is the difference? World language is French, Spanish, Chinese. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. You're welcome. And Jeff. Uh, two quick things. Uh, first of all, Emily, I think your idea was awesome. I think that could be a really good opportunity to think that also, you know, we, we probably have teachers that have individual skills and, mm -hmm. and things that they never got to bring to the table yet, they would probably love to bring into their classroom. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Mr. Norcia may like the, the idea of like doing a shark, like they can get involved with shark, like the student shark tank that's going on. And I'm sorry, I, I am a teacher, so I can't help but to brainstorm a little bit. Um, maybe a student government period, something like that. So we look forward to hearing from all of you. I I also like the, the word exploratory. I yeah. Like exploratory, which is a little bit along the lines of you what know, Emily was saying about being able to have some opportunities or something. And I taught sewing class in my, when I was a teacher because we had. I could use like a good scarf, afternoon. by the way. Yeah. What's that? I could use a good scarf. Well, no, that would be more like a potato. Potato. But my please. question. Oh, I, I did a oh. question, actually. Oh. But uh, my oh. question, actually. I think, though, the gentleman. Also does, and and the, the the lady to his left brings up a good point about uh, the more we're really learning about students needing to run around and to be free and to let their <coughs> brains go, um, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but I really think it does go to the education of of the of the, of the children. Um, are either <coughs> lunch aides, teachers aides, teachers, or anyone else still allowed to give lunch detentions? and to pull kids away from that free time? 
I'm not really sure. I, I if you could get back to me on that, I'd, I'd appreciate it because it's a big deal to me that kids have that time to run around instead of spend an extra hour. Because I think that if they're there all morning and then they get taken out for an hour for lunch and then they have to sit down and read, they're not getting an education. Thank you. Um, Jeff said something about student government. Um, and I know that some of the elementary schools don't have student government. Is that something we could work on getting into? All of the elementary schools. Sure. Really, that is something that there on the table. that uh, that I think should have been rectified years ago. And I can't, you know, a little bit, but not. Yeah. Part of the issue is that there are no clubs per se at the elementary level. So it's trying to figure out when to do that. Like when can a teacher have time in the schedule to do something like that? So this might be a way to be able to do that. But otherwise, it's been very challenging in the past because they only had a prep. And so obviously they were preparing at that point in time. And then we don't have those clubs the way that the middle and the high school do um, at the end of the day. Was so we got in a few of the elementary schools, but not in all of them. Mm -hmm. Just wondering if yeah. that was something. And I also want to agree with Jeff. Um, there should be no lunch. Hold on a second. Um, it's OK. I can, I can move. Hold on one second. I'm not going to say correct me if I'm wrong again. <laughs> Depending on the grade level, the module times are going to change. That's correct. So, so, that, so this so one has, so this, this one has the personalized, right, right, right. Okay, no, I, I want to make sure. Right. Dawn and then David. Um, I was going to bring up that point, um, that that might happen at a different time for different correct. Uh, grade levels or, or what have you. But, yeah. um, and I'm sure you're going to ensure that this happens. I'm, I don't have a flea hat on, I have a phys ed hat, a health hat on right now. Um, 150 minutes and somehow we're going to make sure that that absolutely. meets that requirement. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Now, um, I remember in the strategy meeting we talked about the world languages and a goal of trying to get it more, you know, I know right now like some schools just have Chinese and some schools mm -hmm. just have Spanish. Is there a talk or any thought about offering options to kids at the schools or? Uh, not as far as the next year. And, and the difficulty with offering options is staffing. Sure. Because you have to be separately certified. You have to, you're either a teacher of Spanish or a teacher of French or a teacher of Chinese. We have one teacher that's certified in both French, um, French and Spanish. But otherwise, it's very difficult. And then you have teachers traveling all sure. over. Yeah. Um, and we worked really long for many, many years to be able to get one language into each building because then what happens, I don't know if anybody <coughs> went to Lynn Crest's, uh, you know, when they celebrated the Chinese New Year and it, the Lunar New Year. And it was amazing because they get their music teachers and their art teachers and their phys ed teachers and their classroom teachers involved. So when you have one school with one language, you can bring everybody sure. into it. And when you have like we used to in the past, some Spanish, some French, it was very choppy. But now you can you know, do announcements in the target language, and you can label things throughout the building in the target language, and you can count jumping jacks and his ed in the target language, so. Again, again correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> the, um, as far as world language is concerned, there is no, absolutely, it's exploratory. Absolutely. So, one day a week. Um, so there is no problem whatsoever once they get up to middle schools to take any of the languages that they want. Yes, so. and, and I believe that what we've been doing um, is bringing some of those teachers into the fifth grade elementary. So if they're not a school of Chinese, they can hear from French and, and Spanish teachers because they do have the opportunity to switch. And we certainly do have students that switch. I would say the majority do not, but we certainly have some that do. And then they can switch again um, once they go into high school. So that's just, always available. Just a quick note on languages. I think research shows that the earliest the exposure is to a language, the more beneficial it is. I, I, you know, I, I know it took years to bring one language to a school, mm -hmm. but if there was a possibility to, to have a choice and you know, maybe something that has to do with the language of the town, or, you know, I don't know, but, but for, for a student to start a language of sixth, seventh, eighth grade, no, they start in kindergarten. Right, no, but I'm saying if, if then, they, then they switch to the language of their choice at a later age, not, 
not, not very beneficial as it is to start at a younger age. Except that if you have any experience with any language, a second language, you can transfer those skills over. So for example, in English, we don't have feminine and masculine adjectives that have to agree with the nouns. But many of our Romance languages do. So if you learned that in French, you'd be able to transfer that skill over to Spanish. So the thing is, again, unless we had tons of money to hire a Chinese, French, and Spanish teacher for every building, just practicality is very, very challenging. Um, so they get it once a week. They talk about culture, but they talk about the language. It's, it's, um, it's an exposure, more so than you're going to walk out of fifth grade speaking fluently in a language. That's not the, the target. So just throwing it out there, I don't know if it's possible, but what about kind of video conferencing, oh, school, we, district wide language, I don't know. We, we've done video in the past where it's not the human being in the room and it was years ago. We did muzzy French and salsa Spanish. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was so okay. Probably improved since then. Maybe probably it has. Take a look yeah. at it. Probably has. Yeah, today, oh. very, you know, if you look at this, it's another <coughs> All right, we have to Just last thing to, and just something to possibly think about if people are concerned about the world language. Maybe you have, um, and it wouldn't expose everybody to everything, but maybe you have, uh, like at Milne's, you have Chinese for two years, and then you switch it to Spanish for two years. So they'll have it in like first and second grade, and they'll have Spanish in third and fourth grade. But it would be not, 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 not designated third and fourth, but the Chinese teacher is in. Uh, in 2020 and 2021 in Milne to Forest, and then 2022 and 20. So they'd be getting it in. I know what you're saying. No, I know what you're saying. So they're exposed for two years, and then every two years they're rotate. In, they're in elementary the, for six years. So right, right. So they have two years of every. Right. Right. But it would be the whole school is getting Chinese for two years, and then the whole school gets, you know. All right, Ron and then Lee. I, I, I understand what you're saying, but wouldn't that be a little difficult on children at that age? Like, you're, you're learning one language for two years, and you're going to learn another language for two years. And that's a lot. Chinese is one of the toughest languages to learn. I don't think they're learning the language when they're in elementary. They're, they're picking learning. up a few things. No, I understand I what you're wrong. saying. No, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying, to me, I'm just thinking as a, I know how young we do it. You know, if you're in first and second grade, you're learning Spanish. And then you're going to start learning some things about Chinese in third and fourth, then go to French. You know, I mean, I just think it's, I don't know, it's confusing. I understand what they're saying. I mean, listen, I wanted Italian for years, but Chinese is one of the biggest languages right now in the world because of business and so is Spanish. But I understand that. I think it's something we can look at different ideas. I'm just speaking my opinion. Yeah, I just yeah, think yeah. it's very hard. Sometimes kids, you know, and not every kid's going to be able to pick that all up. And then it's like kids are going to be left behind and they're moving over to Spanish. And, so I just think it's something we have to look at, but I think we're, I think we're getting too, personally, I think we're getting too in-depth to it, but let's, let's slow down. So, okay, let's At least. So I just wanted to say, I know the language supervisor isn't here, but I think if the language supervisor was here, if I remember correctly, it doesn't matter what language you learn, it's the area of your brain that's opened up. So if you're learning a second language, it doesn't make a difference what language it is. You're keeping the area of your brain open, which makes it, because you learn, when you're like 12 or 13 and you start learning language, which is what they used to do in middle school, you learn from a different part of your brain. When you're infant to like, you know, 10 years old, you learn from a different part of your brain. So if you keep that area open, um, it doesn't make a difference which language you learn. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they learn about a half a year's worth of what used to be like Spanish one, let's say, or French one. They learn about, in the whole of elementary school, you learn about a half year's worth of the language. So the total of all four or five of those years of learning language is only about a half year's worth. So when they start middle school, whichever language they, they pick, they start from a beginning. Um, and the kids that were in that language can start like it's only like a half year ahead. So it's not, it's not a major um, disruption to have learned one language and switch. All right, we're going to move on to we're going to move on to middle school. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so again, I'll try to go quickly. With middle school scheduling, again, consistency across the two schools, we obviously want to look at the house system. And can we put this into place for our six <coughs> students? Um, and the biggest 
component of that house system is the interdisciplinary teaming, and that's really our focus for middle school. So let's look at this, which is really fun. So let me show you how far we've gotten so far. So we actually just met with Elliot again on Friday. Um, so basically what this shows you is it will show you our core team of teachers, which are our, lang our Lit Connection, Language Arts, Social Studies, Science, and Math teachers are our core team of teachers. This AC stands for academic, so we have some academic level Englishes, so that's in there. And we have our special education teachers and our ELL instructor at the bottom. Because again, as we're planning, we know that houses typically have special education teachers as part of that team as well. So if this is TJ, and this is a sixth grade schedule, and we have our nine periods going across the day, what this is showing you is that we have these teams of teachers scheduled for one house. So it's these teachers working with the same set of students, and period three, period six, and period nine, they don't teach. So these teachers have their prep time, that is theirs. They have another period where on different days they have either a PLC or a duty assigned to them. And then the other, this is our common planning time, right here, period three. So we right now are working on ensuring that sixth grade has, in TJ, for example, would have two houses in the sixth grade. Memorial, because of its size, is basically one house in the sixth grade. It would be one house in the seventh and one in the eighth. And we are working on making that work. Um, these are preliminary um, frameworks, again, looking at everything. Um, obviously, though, we can't look at sixth grade in isolation. We have to make sure that our seventh grade and our eighth grade schedules can also work. So we still have to look at that. We have set up a template for sixth grade. Now we just have to ensure we can still manage to schedule our seventh and eighth grade, um, grade levels as well. So again, we have our special education resource rooms and our inclusion classes working. Our co-teaching is in here. You can see that we've got a co-teaching class here and a co-teaching class here, so those two teachers would be able to work with one another. So we are well on our way to getting this house model built in our middle schools. Uh, Besides that they're going to have a team of teachers, can you please explain how a student's uh, experience as a sixth grader will be different next year as opposed to this year? So right now the experience would be different because they would they would be a group of students that would share the same set of teachers. So those teachers will be much more familiar with the students. They should hopefully develop much closer relationships with their teachers. And we haven't gone beyond the actual scheduling yet, but I would hope that we would be putting in some other activities and some other pieces that would bring them together as a group. Right now we have not, again, we are not near there yet. We are making we sure. We haven't talked about how yet, but it's still to come. Right, because this is so okay. this is just the schedule. I'm only talking about the schedule right now, okay. and so I can show you how we're trying to structure it to right. even work towards. So that I house. should ask later about whether or not, because right now it looks like they go still go periods one to nine. <coughs> we are not right because the discussion was not to change the schedule, so we're not changing the structure of the schedule. That is something for down the road, and something we certainly like to look into. Right now. It was to bring the house concept in, and the house concept works across periods just like this. Um, I think you're thinking more of changing to a block schedule, an alternating block, a rotating block. All yeah, I guess I was under the impression that kids weren't going, that 11 year olds weren't going to have to experience like a high school type schedule where they're going one to nine, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. locker time, and that I, I, I guess I misunderstood. I thought we were in. I shouldn't say if we were in agreement or not. I just maybe it was just my thinking that students would uh, wouldn't be under such pressure to have as many classes, <coughs> as much changing, and to have that that onus of having the same kind of day as a twelfth grader. So my understanding was we were going to try to get the house concept in. However, when we open it up and have our fifth graders in, there was a lot of discussion surrounding what that schedule will look like. That's it. A house was a piece of that. 
but my understanding yeah. was we were charged well, yeah, with... Yeah, to me. It is disappointing, Mike. And I don't need to chime in on that because that's not what I was hoping for. Because I don't like the sixth graders being treated like 12th graders. Of course, they're not ready for it. And that's the whole point of what's going wrong. We haven't fixed anything. Um, the, one th the, one thing I'll, the one thing I'll say is if, I, if I'm reading the schedule right, mm -hmm. and the whole house concept, which I believe Mr. Durso is going to be talking about, right? Yes. Um, is to have these, because sixth graders aren't treated like 12th graders. They are. They are treated, if we, if we want to say, they are following a schedule that is a very traditional period by period schedule. But they're not uh, treated the like. The approach with sixth graders is, yes, it's, it's different. And the whole, the um, whole deal, because I teach sixth grade, so I know a little bit about this. The whole, the whole deal with teaming and a house structure is in the teachers working together mm -hmm. as a team of teachers that do cross-curricular stuff, mm -hmm. that talk about the kids daily, mm -hmm. that, that can see when the kids, when there's a problem with a, with a student um, and they see that a student, there's something wrong, mm -hmm. that, that, for lack of a better word, intervention could take place um, and it's a whole, it's a whole different animal. So we're saying that those things aren't being done now. That kids, they're not. They're not being done as a team. Because that's exactly what you're saying. You're saying so, that those things haven't, that aren't happening now. That they're only be happening later. So we absolutely, Jeff. We definitely have um, Sherry and Scott have both tried to schedule as much as possible teaming time. Some years it's been more subject focused, so it's been more departmental. Sometimes it's interdisciplinary. However, it's not happening on an almost daily basis. So, and it's also not necessarily the same teachers sharing the same kids with a lot of overlap. And so we're trying to tighten that up. I agree with you that I would like to see scheduling changes at some point. That's not for September, those are huge massive undertakings with changing an entire structure of a building. Um, it's something that we certainly plan on looking at. My understanding was for September that we were looking to get the house structure in place for sixth grade. Um, so. Ron. My question is, I'm looking at the schedule. Mm -hmm. um, TMDM is planning. Uh, that was team or our departmental. It, it's basically our, this what, is our team time. Okay, so what, it's like that time, um, that and the plan, like what are the students doing? Like, so, how, how, is right. that, how is that being applied? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Right, so um, students have two separate periods of rotations. Yes. So one of those periods <coughs> would be phys ed, Okay. and health rotating on an A B okay. day. Another period would be two marking periods of dynamic applications, one marking period of art, one marking period of music, and then the other one would be their world language block. So we're only giving, they're only getting one period or whatever, of music and one of art, that's it? Every day, for the, every day for an entire marking period. That's it, but then they're done for the year? Then they're done for the year, yes. Okay. So they get a marking period of music, a marking period of art, and then two of dynamic applications. So the, the thing is with this schedule is you're trying to set the schedule up to work within the houses. Is that what the purpose of this was? This, again, or is, or is, this is what our schedule basically looks like. The right periods, now. the rotations. Yeah. We haven't changed our course offerings. We haven't changed our periods of time or start, end day, nothing like that. So it is still structured with 40 or 42 minute periods. Um, but what we're doing is trying to assign the same group of teachers to the same group of students so that they can have this common planning time, time to meet, time to collaborate, time to discuss children. So a group of group, if you have 300 kids, let's just say they're going to be broken up. About 125 kids per house, okay. just you know, for an average. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, Okay, so I think my reading right now of all this is that 
this will make a difference for the middle school teachers in terms of the feel of their day and their work, but it might not make that big of a difference for the feel of the students of how they experience middle school because they're switching for nine periods regardless whether they're in the house or not in the house. That, to me, my guess is if you're a middle school student, that kind of trumps what your middle school experience is about. Like, sure, teachers are talking to each other, are kind of planning, and there's lessons being kind of cross-referenced. That could, that could make a little bit of a difference, but it's not fundamentally transforming the middle school experience for the students, the house model. Yeah, I just want to say that in the discussion of fifth graders moving up to our middle schools, it was an opportunity to hear from the community about how they feel about our middle schools today. And it doesn't matter if it was a parent with a child in Memorial or a parent with a child in TJ. I heard a lot, at least anecdotally, from parents who are not happy with the junior high model in our middle schools. And we're really looking forward to having the fifth graders come in and have this be an opportunity. Again, not that we're doing things wrong, but like it, it could potentially be a missed opportunity at this moment in time to take a deeper dive into once those fifth graders come in. Because right now, fifth grade, is to me seems like it's a no man's land. Like you presented the elementary school schedule, you presented the middle school schedule, but I have no idea. Fifth grade is well, we're not there yet. So, so, so let me. I'm just going to react for okay. just one second. So we're talking about September, and if if you're working in a school district, and especially one as large as ours, with all the personnel we have and all of the different pieces of the puzzle, to from now, yes, until September, yes try to successfully restructure the entire way that you present curriculum and run a school building is just not possible. Understood. And it won't go over well totally. at all. We will be a total failure. So interdisciplinary teaming is a major critical <coughs> component of middle school life. And, and I have an article that I can share with you. Um, but it, it's a hallmark of middle schools, not junior highs, middle schools the house concept is part of. So that's one factor that's part of it. They don't necessarily talk about a drop ad rotating block schedule. They don't talk about that in, in the literature. They talk about interdisciplinary opportunities. And having these teachers here being able to talk and plan can provide some of those interdisciplinary opportunities. But regardless, it doesn't, honestly, change the way the teachers function that much. I know you think it changes it more for the teacher than the student. It's equal. Teachers are used to meeting anyway with colleagues. They're still teaching the same number of periods. They still have the same number of duties and PLC. None of that has changed for the teacher. What we've done is we've said we want these 125 students being taken care of by these eight teachers so that they know these kids. They know their strengths. They know their needs. They know what learning strategies are best for each child. They sit and they talk about students. They plan together, but they talk about students. And so I don't see how that does not help kids. I, okay, so I that's why when people said, like, we could implement the house system by the September, I was like, wow, that seems fast. Well, because, because I didn't understand. you might have had a different, yeah. Yes, but I think, and you know I'm all for, like, let's, you know, take the time we need to get it right yeah. and plan and, you know, do things incrementally, but we have a two-year runway until that fifth grade moves up. And, and so we have a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to make sure the administration, and, and I think it's an opportunity for the board to, to talk about those longer-term things that we want to see potentially happen in our middle schools that this is admittedly not doing and can't do. Right. So I think that some of the things that have already come up is we've already talked about modifying the schedule, at least for fifth grade students. We've already had those conversations in my presentations um, and in other discussions. We've talked about that. We've heard parents say that they don't think they want their fifth graders having a traditional middle school schedule. And I've always said, I'm not so sure we keep this to just a fifth grade thought. Why are we not considering the structure of our middle schools as a whole? Yes. We have an opportunity. Yes. I can tell you principals, supervisors, Ernie, Nick, we're excited about the possibility of doing something new and exciting. We are, but for this year, that's the conversation, but in practice, really, we're just trying to get the initial pieces of a house system in place. 
We've talked about advisory. That's another component of not a house. Advisory is not a house, but advisory is one of those components for really effective middle school. So I think maybe what happened is we kind of crossed our communication, and when we were thinking about putting a house model in, we were thinking all those other pieces, which are really separate from the house, but are good practice in a middle school. So I think we are on the same page, and I think I'm on the same page with Jeff as far as seeing a need. Well, I know you disagree, Jeff, but my understanding with what I was, what our discussions were, was we were going to look at getting interdisciplinary teaming together and, and putting that in, so. Mayor. Okay, so we are underestimating this schedule. We are under, as now I want to talk as the teacher who taught in a house in the middle school in Memorial and in TJ. We had houses, we had teams. This is what we're underestimating, even if we did nothing more than this schedule. If nothing else happened, and I know we want all the rest of it to happen. When you have four teachers that have the same children, that schedule, that schedule with bells and every other thing can become fluid because the four teachers can take their children from their houses for periods one and two to do something. They can take the children and plan an activity that spans a day and bring in their, their science, their, um, I'm sorry, their music and art and phys ed teachers. We did that. We did that. We, we did this when we had our houses and our teams at TJ and at Memorial. We would plan the interdisciplinary activity. We had a we had professors of archaeology from Montclair University come, and we had an entire day working with them. And principals and teachers can take any schedule and can suspend the schedule for that day because something exciting is about to happen. So we should not underestimate just the potential of A, a schedule like this, of B, simply putting four teachers together with all the same children. That alone, because we, and then, then you will have training for the teachers on the possibilities and the potential, et cetera. But I actually, when I looked at this schedule, I saw very much what we had. Junior high and middle are semantic terms, but they're a mentality as well. There is a mentality about what a middle school is. There's a mentality about what a junior high school is. We've slipped away a little from the middle school mentality to the junior high school mentality. We've kept the name, but we've slipped away from the philosophy of what middle school is. So I see this as step one, but already opening up a big door to what can be. And I would not, Jeff, be uh, disheartened at all by the possibilities here of what can happen next year and the year after as changes, because changes have to be made gradually. You as a teacher have to respect and know 100% that you have a staff you can't just throw into you know, willy-nilly, you name it, you know. You would want, not want that to happen to you, so I know you would not want that to happen to our staff. A lot of training has to go on, and things have to be phased in over and two years or three years or four years. And, and that's a point that you bring up that's really important, Mary, is there is, you know, we have to learn how to teach within this, too. It's not instinctive for everybody no. and they don't know the possibilities that they've never taught in this manner before so we do have to provide professional development and we have to start somewhere and so we're starting somewhere and going to continue to build on it as time goes on and I think again the next three years are times of change and, and things will look different Mark Elise Jean May. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I never worked in a middle school. I really don't know how to read this schedule. You have well, D's there, and you, you have no E so, up there, and, and well, because 0102. This is, yeah, this is just a very, this, this is not a full schedule. This is us brainstorming and trying to come up with a structure. So really what you need to take from this is that we have scheduled in the opportunity for teachers to have their PLC duty time, their prep time, and their team time. This is showing you sections of classes, so this science teacher would have these five periods teaching. Okay. So that's just really what that means. And then this is a six enriched, this is a math six. So it's just kind of naming some of our courses, which the details, the details we'll get into when it's more solidified, but basically just trying to show you the teachers that we're trying to line up together to share okay. the same group of students. <coughs> So, I mean, this is kind of what I was expecting, um, you know, based on what you were saying. But I, I also just wanted to mention that the state is going towards, you know, middle school science teachers teaching science and middle school math teachers teaching math. So I'm not exactly sure what you're looking for other than, I mean, because to me the, the team idea is, is the idea that, you know, if they're, you know, read a biography in English of a scientist and then do all the scientists' experiments in their science class and then discuss where that person fit in history, that's the idea of what the teaming should be right. so that the classes are interrelated and sure. the teachers are relating to each other and making those lessons so that they fit. It's and connecting. And the it, it connects right. all the dots. Mm -hmm. But as far as the, the timing, I, mean, I think you know the state's going to tell you you have to have a math teacher teaching math and you have to have a science teacher teaching science. So, so Definitely seventh and eighth grade. Sixth but, grade well, we have right. a little flexibility but, right. at the moment. Fifth and sixth, right. right. But right. So this is for sixth grade for, for next year. Right. And then when the you have two years till the fifth grade gets there where you can do some Okay. Yes. Yeah, it was my understanding that <clears throat> this is where we're going with the sixth grade. Next year we're gonna look at trying to do the seventh grade in the following year for eighth grade. That was the way I understood it. Also, regard to, I'm not sure exactly what the next phase would be, but we're talking about block schedule, modified block schedule, rotating block schedule. I'm going to do a seminar on that, a, a workshop. And it is so complex Absolutely. and so involved. Mm -hmm. There are so many factors to be considered, mm -hmm. not the least of which is teaching time, you know, personnel certification, personnel certification oh, yeah. um, and mm -hmm. He went through, and this is maybe 10 years ago, he went through all the issues that they had. So it was a long, drawn-out process. And I think it took him four years to get from A to Z. Mm -hmm. and, and in the end, they, they still had some blowback from parents, teachers, uh, students, because they didn't like it. Even though it had been <coughs> talked about, so for us to even think about doing anything at this point as far as taking the next step towards it, whatever the block schedule, whatever the change the schedule would be, I think we're, we're going to be very premature because mm -hmm. you've got to do sixth grade, you've got to do seventh grade, you've got to do eighth grade, you've got to do fifth grade. Fifth grade. We, we've got to get the building built. Um, so I'm not saying we're not going to do it. I, I think we should continue to look at it. No. But it's, it's a process. It's a long process. Mm -hmm. And if we want to do it right, the only way I think Mary said incrementally is the way to do it. A, B, C, until you get to Z. And then you're still running into roadblocks from, from this guy's experience in another district. Right. And, and I think it was a district comparable to ours in, in Little Jersey someplace. And, you know, there are other components. We can talk about doing advisories. We can talk about exploratories. Um, these are things that are already floating in our heads. We've already talked about it because sometimes there are things you can put in a little bit easier than other things. So doing this incorporating advisory, those are relatively easy compared to restructuring the entire building. Um, so, I mean, it's an exciting time for us, and we're certainly not giving anything up at this point or thinking we're not going to look into it. We certainly want to explore everything we can explore uh, about how to restructure these middle schools, but it is a long process. So. All right. Um, just my envisioning of the whole thing was we were going to start with the team meeting. Um, and today, tonight was always built, this education committee meeting 
was always billed as the starting point. The starting point, not the ending point. The start of the discussion, back and forth between the administration and the board. In my, in my mind, and we'll see whether it turns out that way, once we do get the fifth graders up in the middle school, the fifth grade year, that first year, would be a transition year. The whole year would be a transition year to those fifth grade, for those fifth graders, which means they don't necessarily change for, they wouldn't change for every class, and, and they'd have some components of an elementary school and some components <coughs> of the middle school. And then I always envisioned the sixth grade kind of being connected to that but getting more into the middle school model, but still being connected to that a little bit, the elementary school model. That's why I've always said that I think that this change is, gonna, is going to be good for sixth graders as well as um, fifth graders. And I think the sixth grade teachers are going to love the fact that now in sixth grade, you are more departmentalized, and um, the kids are going to be coming in there ready to do that more than they are now because now sixth grade is we transition them real quick into into following this following this thing and then the seventh and eighth grade which has to be department departmentalized you, you uh, unless teachers have dual certifications they can't cross cross teach into another into another um, discipline um, that's when you're going to start, transi start transitioning them into, into more of the high school model to get them ready for high school. I'm not saying you're still going to have your teaming and your houses, but, you're, but, but by the time they're done with eighth grade, they'll be ready for high school. And that's the way I've always envisioned it. You can't do it in one year. And this is the beginning of a, of a, of a conversation that we're going to keep having. And um, you have to start somewhere. And you can't just say, okay, next year we're going to, we're going to a house system and for, for the whole schools and have fun teachers, go for it. it, it it's, a, it's, a, it's a transition. So that's how I see it, Emily. So just to help me understand this step in this longer term process and conversation, you said Memorial Middle School is going to have effectively one house in sixth grade. So how is that different from how things are done currently? Help me understand the change. Because they don't necessarily have the same teachers teaching the same set of students. So you have teachers that are cross grade. You have maybe 11 teachers that are teaching the same set of students. They don't necessarily have common planning time. So it's so what you try to do with the house is have just <coughs> these teachers teaching just these kids as much as possible. You don't want 20 different teachers jumping in on the party and having those students because then you can't sit and talk about the kids because you're trying to bring in 20 different teachers because between five different subjects or six different subjects, you've spread out the teacher power so far that you can never bring them together to talk about the students. Think about how powerful is a parent coming into a meeting and being able to meet during that block with all four teachers at the same time rather than have them stagger in and out. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different reasons why this helps students. No, I get it. Um, so this implementing house in the sixth grade will have implications for some seventh and eighth grade teachers. Because if I'm a teacher teaching some sixth grade classes, some seventh grade classes, now I'm not going to be teaching sixth grade anymore, right? So that's the part where I was saying that we can't do a sixth grade schedule without seeing how it impacts seventh and eighth. <coughs> because we have to look at our teachers and their certifications and say, <coughs> who can teach what? Who's able to teach what? If we tried to keep it this way, how does that impact our staff? So, so we can't look at it in isolation. We start here. But then we have to really look at the ramifications to 7th grade and 8th grade as well, because you're right, it could impact. And just to understand, in memorials, that's easiest to get my head around, is a short house. There'll be a group of, let's say, five teachers who have 100, the, all the 150 kids or whatever it is. Like, is Approximately. There I mean, there are, there are subgroups 
Are there going to be, is there another group of five teachers who have another group of 150? So nothing is perfect. So you are going to have some crossing um, of staff. So there are going to be times when you are going to have crossing of staff. But ideally, it's this group of teachers with the sixth grade, this group of teachers with the seventh, and a different set of teachers with the eighth. That's the ideal world. So it doesn't, there's not enough teams. So there aren't two teams of teachers in the sixth grade at Memorial. Not big enough. Not because, big enough. Right. Exactly. <coughs> because of the total number of students per grade. So that's what makes it very challenging. It's very rare that they give us the exact amount of people that we need to create this perfectly even house system. So you do your best with what you have and um, we are going to improve what we have now and, and try to have the fewest number of teachers working with the same set of kids with as many common planning times during the day and during the week as possible. Okay, just one follow-up question. Sure. How are you going to evaluate this rollout in the sixth grade? Like, are you, do you have a plan for like systematically assessing where it's going right, what was challenging, reporting back to the public, how it's we going? We don't have any of that in place as of this time. We're still trying to see if it's going to play out and work the way it, that we would like it to. It'd be helpful to so, know at the end of the year, whatever happened, you know, whatever happened in the time to have. So that all of us in the room are really interested in it can actually learn like where did it where did it work and where are things that still need to be figured out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to go to Mary and then I I, I have to move on because we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of teachers and stuff here that have been waiting for for quite a long time to uh, to do their presentation. So all I wanted to add was an example for Emily. One year um, our team, our house, there was an overflow of about 30 students. And Jen Bauman taught the English, mm -hmm. but they worked out that she would have team time with us mm -hmm. so that she was able to be on the same page. Because I was teaching five sections. She was only teaching one, but she was there with me so that she knew and we knew, well, what are we teaching? And we were both teaching the same thing. So that that's... Given how memorial is, that can be worked out that way because that did happen occasionally at TJ. We just there were just too many kids for me to teach. There were two houses, but too many for the two English teachers, and Jen was picking up extra uh, levels and so forth. So it, it and it can all work out. That's all. Next. Uh, <laughs> okay. Next. So, well, I, I just wanted to. I'm sorry, I forgot about you. <laughs> I just wanted to focus everybody on, on the fact that what we're really doing here is scaffolding. And so, what that means is the sixth grade will be in. We need to evaluate its effectiveness during the year and then after the year. But the key is that the sixth grade house next year will then move up and become the seventh grade. And you'll have a new cohort. Now, that's really important because. We need to be building leadership, and what that means is as we implement the house and teachers become familiar with it, and as well as administrators, we will learn from it. And the idea is that then we transition into the following school year, those sixth graders having been exposed to the house during the September of 2018 will now be seventh grade, and then we welcome another group. So we will scaffold, that means we'll build upon it and build upon it from there. So it should be a learning experience. You know, and although we had houses in the district and we learned from that, it's been, it's been a number of years before we've done that, you know, since we've done that. We're really starting from scratch. And you know, my, the spirit that I came at that, at this is, we'll do the sixth, we'll learn, we'll improve it, and then the next group of sixth graders will will learn from the experience, but you, it's an appropriate question about how we will evaluate it. It's got to be constantly evaluated because we need to be moving those kids up to the seventh grade, but also working with the teachers to say, how can we make this better? What were the outcomes? What would you do differently? What little improvements do we have? What are some of the larger suggestions? But that's how a school district gets better. We try something new. We evaluate the effectiveness, 
and then we put all of that together so that we're on a constant cycle of continuous improvement. So I'm sorry. And we do, and it's been my, um, it's been my experience of being on the board that every new initiative is is is, is reviewed and and goes through critique and and all the time they're, they're constantly taking data on that on on effectiveness of what we're doing. Um, I, I have to move on to the thing. There will be time when they're done with their presentation for you to ask questions. Okay, so very quickly, the house system. I've talked about this, I've presented this before. So basically, it's again taking that larger school community, dividing it into smaller communities of teachers, staff, and students. Again, developing a sense of connectedness for children, making sure that we provide a safe, supportive environment for them. Because we know that if we don't take care of those basic needs, then the academics really are not going to come. Um, so again, we want teacher or students rather to identify with a particular group of uh, teachers and staff. And we also talked about how uh, within these teams we typically have special education teachers involved. It's usually have guidance counselors and child study team members also attached to those teams, and they're typically led by some kind of administrator. What I thought would be helpful because. Again, some people are not as familiar with the house concept. I talked about it in generalities. I thought that it might be helpful if we have a little bit more of an in-depth description of a particular structure. So keep in mind, please, that houses can look very different in very many different schools. Um, there are a lot of different ways to structure them. I asked Ron Derso and Lauren Gillon, two of our supervisors, they went to Ridgewood and had an in-depth discussion about how their house model is structured. And so because the rest of the meeting tonight is really going to be you folks talking about what you think is important in a house structure, it's for you to get those conversations going, that we thought we could give you a really good example, start those juices flowing and maybe think, oh, I kind of like that idea, or I never thought about that piece. So this is going beyond the house structure a little bit, and it's bringing in some more of those sort of scheduling aspects and some of those other programs. So you're going to hear beyond the house structure, okay? You're going to also hear some of those other pieces. So maybe this will just help give you a vision of what it could be, but we're not necessarily, you know, <coughs> proposing this. It's just a way for you to hear a little bit more in depth about what a house structure could look like, okay? So Lauren and I had an opportunity to go and visit Benjamin Franklin Middle School in Ridgewood um, back in December while we were visiting other schools to find out about how they do the fifth grade into eighth grade. So Ridgewood School is a sixth through eighth school, so we were really there to focus on how they did their eighth grade model. There were some fifth grade teachers that came with us. Um, we got to meet with their principal, who was Tony Orsino. He was great. He really spent a lot of time with us. Uh, a guidance counselor, I think both guidance counselors wind up coming to the meeting. Um, and they, they shared a lot about their house system, what makes it work. So we were asked tonight just to share a little bit about what their house system is all about, just to sort of informally, so that we could do some brainstorming. So they have teams within their houses. Each house has a mixed grade, which would be eventually having some sixth, seventh, eighth grade students, that's how they do it. And then their teams of teachers are made up of math, science, social studies, and English teachers. The house composition, when they come up with the students that are in the houses, they try to equalize genders so that there's a mix of boys and girls. They spread out the students with IEPs. They make sure that the siblings are placed into the same houses because they really have these houses kind of drive the culture of their schools. I kind of picture it as Harry Potter when the students get sorted by their hats, the sorting hat. In their house system, because of the size of the school, they have about 380 students per house. But the principal said, just like Natalie was saying before, optimal in their school would be about 300 students. <coughs> so it doesn't even work perfectly for them with the numbers of students. So because they have 380 students per house, 
they have two houses at Ridgewood, at, at Benjamin Franklin. The other middle school, I believe, has three houses because it's larger. The way that the house is set up with regard to leadership and guidance, they have one assistant principal per house. So that's one of the things that makes the, the school within a school model work there. And then they, one school in Ridgewood has three guidance counselors, and one school in Ridgewood has two guidance counselors. So the school that has the three guidance counselors, they get, each guidance counselor gets a grade. So there's a sixth grade guidance counselor, a seventh grade guidance counselor. The school that has two guidance counselors assigns one guidance counselor per house. Um, their special education program, they have LLD and power educator support. And then with regard to their schedule, uh, they, they have a different kind of schedule and they, they build in an advisory period, which I know is something that we've been talking a lot about in Fairlawn. The way that they have it set up is that every Friday, the last period of the day, they have advisory built in. So um, they have 57 minutes, so, at the, so they have 57 minute periods. So they take seven minutes off of every period, and then they have that advisory period left at the end of the day. They mix the houses together. So I know and the one thing that's come up over the conversations is making sure that the students from each house get to know each other a little bit as well. They do that there. So that the, the academic part, the houses are separated, but when they come into that activity, the advisory period, they mix together. And then during the advisory period, each grade level has a different topic that they learn about. So over the past couple of years, sixth grade has been learning about diversity, seventh grade there has been learning about service learning, and then the eighth grade has been working on mindfulness. And then the nice thing too for teachers in their planning, that advisory period is the only time that the assemblies are ever planned. So they never have to rearrange like on a random Monday to have an assembly. They just wait for that, that, uh, that, that Wednesday. Um, I don't know if Ron talked about this as well, the structure of their building, the way that it was set up. Um, they had all, so I think their two houses were called Ramapo and Ridge. Yeah. So if you were in the Ridge house, you were in the Ridge house for grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. And if you were in the Ramapo house, grade six, seven, and eight. So those were the two separate houses, and then the teams would be the sixth grade team, the seventh grade team, the eighth grade team within those houses. Um, and they had them, the way that the building was set up is that all the kids in the, uh, Ridge, or the Ridge House were sort of in one area, and then the kids on the Ramapo um, house were in another area. And their thought behind that was, as kids progressed, they would still see their sixth grade teachers in the hallway when they were in seventh grade, and then see their sixth and seventh grade teachers when they were in eighth grade, so still keeping in that like small little community. Um, one of the things with electives, um, music was required, a required elective in grades six and seven, um, and then they also had a technology elective in grades six and seven. In grade eight, they had um, freedom of choice for their electives during the course of the year. Um, they had some STEM and robotics things, um, TV production, music, art, um, physical education and health were full year. Um, some schools do um, where one house is one particular world language and another house might be another particular world language. They didn't do it that way. They had Spanish and French in both, um, in both houses. Um, the, all the classes, except for math, were heterogeneous, so they did have enriched math starting in grade six, grade six, seven, and eight. Um, and then they also had, um, for enrichment, an exploratory period um, that kids could elect to take during those elective times, um, like the STEM classes and other things like that. Uh, and collaboration. So teacher, um, teacher teams within the houses collaborated during a planning period, just like kind of what we showed, and Nick had mentioned this earlier, is that they only do parent conferences and parent meetings during that TMDM period where the teachers have that, um, that common planning time. Um, so then they said it prevented from having to pull teachers out of classes <coughs> and get coverages because if you wanted a parent meeting, it would all happen in the same period because all the kids, or all the students, teachers would be off that period. So I think those were just kind of the facts that we wanted to give you um, about um, at Benjamin Franklin what their house system looked like. You feel good about that? Okay. <laughs> Any questions or comments about that? The only comment I'll, I'll make is that that is 
almost, with, including fifth grade in my school, mm -hmm. fifth grade was a little, is a little different because they had less, there was less teams of teachers. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty much the way, they, they, we don't have an advisory period um, just because we couldn't fit it in. We have an enrich, what we call an enrichment period instead. Mm -hmm. But it was typical, very close to rigid. And again, you know, in this case, it was, you know, the houses were made up of teens, right? Mm -hmm. But within those houses, their houses had students from every grade level in the house. But there was a sixth grade team and a seventh grade team mm -hmm. and an eighth grade team. So even though they were under the same house with the same guidance counselors, perhaps in the same, um, uh, the same administrator, um, they were separated by grade level within that house. Some places, the house structure is by grade level. So you might have, you know, sixth grade is a house with two teams, or they might make two houses within the sixth grade. There's different ways to structure it. This was just one example. Mark, whether you call it a house or a team, you have the same teachers focused in on the same individuals. But nowhere in any of any teams or any houses in any school district, is there ever a music teacher or a phys ed teacher or an art teacher involved in the discussion with the child? And they, they have important facts as well that they can contribute to these discussions. So why is that, that they're, they're not involved? Because you need somebody, you need some place to put the children while all these other teachers are all. So it, you're right. It's very. That's why I showed you before who the core teachers were, because the only way to free up those teachers to meet is by not having children. So it's when the children go to those electives and those specials that the core academic teachers are able to be free to meet. It doesn't mean that they don't get input. I can tell you that. So I know how our do they get your input? Um, either the guidance counselors speak privately with those teachers, or they may have them write something. They often will have the, um, the special subject teachers write a paragraph or something about the child. So it could be one or both of those ways that they do that. But it's not that they don't care about that input. They do indeed speak with all of their teachers to bring that to the table. That teacher's just not going to be presently sitting in that room. Typically, in my, in my school, for example, that, because that's what I know, I apologize for not bringing that up, but typically in my school, the, the specials teachers are, have their own team. And because they teach, in my school, they teach every single kid. So they have all the kids, obviously, um, on all grade levels. So um, they do. They keep in constant contact with the guidance counselors, and when we, when there's a problem, when they, they have a question about a kid, or we, they send messages to the team meeting, or, um, and or we teachers talk back and forth. So they are involved well, in some. Yeah. Matters. Oh, sure. You are. And you know what else, Mark? Let's just say that there is a concern. Say the guidance counselor finds out from the physical education teacher that there is a concern. During that meeting, the English teacher might give her a report and then go and free up the phys ed teacher to come in and sit on that meeting. So they're, they definitely get input. We don't discount that. Yeah. At least. So I just want to know if there's a requirement for them to meet during those, like either the PLC time, depending on thinking of what was up there, the, <coughs> the, day or the middle of the day, is there a requirement for the teachers to meet? Um, like if it's your regular prep time where you might want to sit and you know do a lesson or you might want to sit and write a letter or you know answer right. some emails or whatever it is like or yes <laughs> the answer is yes because if we went back um, this is their prep <coughs> we don't touch their prep right but then they would be assigned that so now I know that in the middle schools it might not be every day that they have team time um, both of the principals have tried very hard to do that as best they can. It will be on their schedule, team meeting time. And it is very clearly written on a teacher's schedule that that's where they're expected so they, to So be. they're required to meet and do like a lesson together or discuss the students or, or with yes. them. Because that is when they would schedule parents to come in. 
So, you know, right, but if there's no parents coming in, they if plan, I want to read the they paper, plan, they can talk about students, whatever. Okay. Uh, very often, it'll be somebody different going in every week. So even if there's not a parent meeting, we typically, again, I can speak to Memorial because I was there, we would have guidance counselors go in to those meetings. So, so it's the not a duty. counselor could come in, even, it's not their duty, the duty is this period. They have three periods in the middle school. Well, m most teachers teach five periods and then have lunch duty and prep. And so they have an extra PLC. So this is their duty slash PLC. They get assigned duties typically twice a week and PLC time to meet with their um, colleagues the other three days. They have their, we don't touch prep time, and then the assigned team time. So there's actually an extra time slot in their schedule that is not there in our high school schedule. Okay. Right. Are, you, are you thinking about like having team leader, like team leaders type of thing? Um, you know, making that, that, that's, when we went back to the team model mm -hmm. at my school, they negotiated with the, uh, a stipend with the association or team leaders, um, so to, to make, to, to, to just hold it all together. Yeah, that's nothing that we've talked about at this point, but Nate's writing it down. <laughs> um, Emily. Uh, okay, so two questions. I have more. So, uh, it was interesting, to, I mean, all that was really interesting, but uh, the idea of the advisory, um, as the way they did that by cut shaving off seven minutes of each period on Fridays, is that something that we are talking about doing sooner rather than later for all grade levels? So as I said earlier, there are definitely pieces, including advisory, that I said we could probably figure out a way to do that without a major overhaul of right. hours. So yes, that is certainly something that we want to look into. It's an important piece. And again, it might not be this it, it might not be this September, probably won't be this September, but it also doesn't mean we can't, that requires training. It requires us to structure which students go with what teachers at what time, all that, we can figure that out. The other piece is they had these nice long 57 minute blocks. So when you took away the seven minutes, they still had a nice 50 minute block. We have 42 or 40? Oh, 40. 40 minute period. So it's hard to take a lot more time away from that, but there's no reason why we can't think about doing something once a month. I mean, there's a lot of ideas that we're throwing around. Right now, we're so focused on the house piece, but we want to do advisory sooner versus later. Again, there are pieces we could put in without totally restructuring. Natalie and, I, Natalie and I were very intrigued that Ron brought that information back to Bridgewood. I thought it was a great idea. Um, shared it with Elliot uh, Thursday um, as well, and we talked about it. But as we keep saying, this was just step one. Couldn't get it for September, but we thought about wow, how like every Wednesday afternoon we bring the whole building together for an assembly or whatever it may be. There's so many, and once again, endless possibilities that you could have for that. That just didn't work for this September, but we thought it was great feedback to bring back. But it's also thinking about the teachers too. You know, learning to teach in a team, mm -hmm. learning to teach advisory. We don't have curriculum for advisory or a plan. Like. Again, there's so many pieces that go into it other than just putting it in a schedule. So the fact that Ridgewood Middle School set 57 minute periods and we have 40 something, does that, to, to make our periods longer, that's more the transformative change that would be yes. disruptive and require a lot of. Yes, so, so when you talk about block scheduling. That was at Ridgewood. Right, so basically what you're talking about is <coughs> having these nine choppy short classes. Let's have a longer length of time, but maybe you don't teach every subject every day. Right. In order to make those longer periods, you might be dropping a certain subject on that given day. Okay, and then the point. next day, you would drop a different subject. Okay. Yeah, so it allows you that time to yeah. sort of dig in and, and do that longer, shuffle. you know, lab. And then my other kind of question slash comment, just a frame to keep in mind. I feel like, um, because Memorial is going to have one house and TJ is going to have two houses, it will be an important thought to keep in mind throughout all of this and how that context is 
going to make decision points different. So instead of, it's almost like instead of unit of analysis being one middle school and another middle school, it's not like we have three effective units to houses. It's just a different mindset than maybe how we thought about our middle schools in the past. And that's what we, so you just gave a really great segue into the next slide because these are the things that you all need to consider, right? So this isn't me telling you that this is the way it's going to be. So right now, and some of it's a, a, a little bit of how we phrase it too. So the sixth grade has one team. Let's stop calling it a house. They have one team of teachers. One team of teachers in seventh grade and one team of teachers in eighth grade. But as you heard in Ridgewood, they have a house that has multiple grade levels within one house. So we might have to restructure the way we kind of think about it too. So sixth grade could be one house at TJ, but they have two teams. So maybe sixth grade at TJ is one house, but there are two independently operating teams within it. And the question is, but TJ, which isn't a question of memorial, is will you keep those that group of students together in seventh grade. So they that's, all well, well. It's, and there's one of the things. So really, the last and very final slide, which is going to lead into the rest of this. Can I just ask something sure. before I go into that last yeah, sure. slide? You talked about the uh, assigned team time. Mm -hmm. Are they meeting every single day? That's what we're trying to do, yes. Is there a possibility that they're not going to meet on a day? Uh, once we start looking at how it impacts seventh and eighth grade, there could be a possibility that we might have a teacher here or there that might have to cross grades. Because if we have set, I'll get back to Mary, if we have seven sections of um, social studies that needs to be taught in a grade level, our teachers can only teach five sections. So you're going to have one person teaching five, the second teacher can only teach two. You have to fill that teacher schedule with another three classes in a different grade. So now it becomes our job to try to figure out how do I get that teacher that teaches sixth and seventh grade to have some team time with sixth grade and some team time with seventh grade. So in those practical situations, that person can't meet five days a week. So that's why I said we try to be as pure as we can, but there's going to be a lot of scenarios where it's not pure and we're working out how do we make it the best that we can. Do you ever see a possibility where a teacher will have nothing to do because that would be an excellent time for personalized, individualized help or so. Not having five classes, you mean, assigned to them? Because I can only assign five. So a teacher, by contract, can only meet with students no, five during periods. that during that team time. That's not counted as a class time. Right, but I can't let them do personalized learning and meet with children because then that's a teaching time. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Student contact. Okay. So, okay. so Jenna, just to sum up what I hear everyone saying, mm -hmm. TJ is going to have one set of things that have to be looked at, mm -hmm. and Memorial is going to be more what um, what Natalie said with the seven sections because that's been the that's been the issue. So they're both going to have their unique. <clears throat> challenges just because because of, of the size of the school. Which is why I can't get it. Like, we haven't gotten to that point where I can show you how it sort of breaks down in each building yet. We just, we're real close, but we're not there yet. Um, but I think a really good starting point is to talk about what do you value in a house system. So think about some of the things we've talked about. Do we think we want the same students staying with the same cohort of, of peers in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and eventually fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. At what points of the day should they be allowed to intermingle, like we heard with the advisory? Um, who do we think should be those core members of that house team? I mean, there are a lot of things to think about, and that's why we wanted to give you a little bit more of a detailed description, because we, we want to hear what you think. This is a, your opportunity to speak about what pieces you believe are sort of you know, well, I want these to be my non-negotiable. This is what my priority would be. Or I think it's important to do it this way. Um, sometimes we're going to be constrained by the sizes of the, the grade levels and the certifications of teachers, as we keep talking about. But what are your thoughts? And I think that's sort of a, a jumping off point for you folks to start chit-chatting so that we could, we could hear what your thoughts are. Do you want to do that now? That's it. Yeah, that, that's my last slide. So comments from the board. 
I, I don't know. I, I, I you know, a lot of times I know right away what I think about something. But I don't know now what I think about students sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade staying in the same group. Because there's opportunity when they're shuffled in the seventh grade to get to know the other students in the school. Um, and then when they're shuffled again in the eighth grade to get to know, again, different students. So I don't have a formed opinion. I, I don't know yet. I, I, I need to hear more about that. Um, that is something I have no opinion on. Anybody else want to kind of feed off of that? I, 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 I will just say that there's an advantage to them staying in the same house. The advantage, the, the big advantage is that same team of teachers that they had in sixth grade get to help the seventh grade teachers kind of know what the difficulties were. The problem is, but on the other hand, a fresh start. Like I don't necessarily, as a teacher, want to. I want to know about their educational difficulties, but I don't necessarily. I want to form my own opinion as them as a student. So, so it's an interesting thing. I think. I think no matter which you decide, there's going to be some kids that just because of stuff that happens in middle school have to be. Changed, you know, like it can't be a, it can't be a, yeah, yeah. Right. a hard. Set. I mean, a matter of fact, it that could happen during the year too. But, but yeah. uh, obviously, but but so there's a lot of things to think about. Did you have anything about? Um, I <clears throat> question about it in terms of kids being tracked specifically in math again at young ages. Does this? So I can help form an opinion. Does this have any impact on the plans for attracting students at, at younger ages? Meaning, like, are we going to put kids in a track based on what they did in fifth grade? That's going to decide what they can do for the rest of their high school career. Still? So, so right now we have the sixth we have math in sixth grade where they start to go into different pathways, and then in seventh and eighth grade they have enriched, as you know, language arts. Um, social studies and science. I think those discussions could certainly be on the table. Yeah, I, mean, that's um, what I certainly don't think any of us have a problem talking about it. I, I, I guess if you're asking for what, for what we would want to see, I'd I, like to see. Absolutely. I'd like to see if students have to be tracked, which I think, for the record, is totally inappropriate for young kids to be tracked and told what they are. And at like 11 years old, you're the smart one. You're not the smart one. So if kids play to that. Um, but if we're if that's not going to change, I'd like to see within their houses that they can move more fluently between one, I hate saying it, level and the other so um, in, in all grade levels. So, if so I think this gives us the opportunity to talk about what are enriched opportunities. So we talked about, I've thrown that word exploratory around a few times. We've talked about choice in electives. And so I think it depends on what do you feel like is an enriched opportunity? Does it have to be an enriched opportunity that's social studies focused? Well, I, I think that or the, can it be a choice to, I like that, electing and I'm no, really I'm talking about No, I'm talking about what the district has already decided what could be enriched kids for a certain select few students based on what they did in fifth grade. But this is what I'm saying right now. What I'm saying is that I think it depends on what we decide enriched opportunities look like. Right now, enriched opportunities are going into these enriched social studies and science and things like that. Well, I'd like to think that all students can be have an opportunity to be enriched. Well, and that's, so that's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is I think that it opens the door for those discussions to say, should we provide opportunities for all students to be able to say, I am really interested, because when Julie's going to tell you that it's about motivation and, and other factors that should come into play. So should it be a I am really motivated to do something in STEM. I'm really motivated to do something in robotics or, you know, environmental something, whatever it is. Do we have an assortment of classes that students can self-select in, in a rotation period? And can that be 
like a genius hour type thing where kids right. get to I, get I, to sort of. Um, I mean, these are again, we have not made any decisions. Next year, we are you know still doing what we have done in the past, and you know, we're not changing our overall schedule. Um, I think that there are many opportunities. I think this is the time over the next couple of years to have these discussions about where we want to go and what we want to do. I think in terms of the choices, I, I don't think that the district should be making the choices for the kids at all. I think that that should be students and, and parents should have a large say about what types of classes that they're going to take. And I think if students want to try enriched classes, whether it be in language, arts, social studies, math, whatever, they should have that opportunity to excel because I think what we really know about kids is when you put them in an opportunity, that you give them the opportunity to be successful, they usually rise to the occasion as to what's happening now where they're placed in a class without any say based on a rubric that no one has ever seen really. So I think this is a good opportunity to provide those opportunities. Otherwise, whether that they stay with each other for years, probably not a good idea to keep them together for four years. I would say two and two when you get to five to eight, maybe one, one then two or two then one doesn't but kind of mixing it up a little so they have opportunities That's to right. be with different peers. There. So I'm going to weigh in on, I'm a big proponent of heterogeneous grouping, uh, particularly at this age level, uh, because at middle school we have to be concerned with the social growth of children, the emotional and the physical, uh, as well as the academic and intellectual. So I, we used to have heterogeneous grouping. That's how I taught it in middle school. That's what I would like to see us go back to. And then provide the exploratory choices. Um, Rutherford, because my granddaughter is going into seventh grade, so she came home with a list. And they have um, each quarter a different elective be it robotics, architecture, art, whatever, and students can choose the um, um, exploratory courses that they are going to be going into. Um, so that, 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 I mean, I'm really committed to that. So you'll hear me pushing that as we continue our discussions in the course of the next two years because I, I really don't, within a heterogeneous group, when you are properly trained in differentiated instruction, when you are properly trained in that, then you know how to differentiate instruction and you know how to offer challenges to your academically talented and so forth. But a, a very important thing that children must learn is that it takes all children together People go out into the business world and they and they work in groups. They don't work isolated uh, because I happen to have a high IQ. Forget the rest of the world. I'm special. I'm working alone. That just isn't how real life is. Uh, you can have the highest IQ in the world and you still have to pay the same fare to get on the bus. So it's important <coughs> for children to learn how to work together. All academic abilities have something to contribute. They have something to share. Not just the bright, and sometimes very bright children need to learn that lesson. They need to learn how to be team players, and they need to value what can be brought to a group by a child that may not be, quote, academically talented, but is musically a genius or is artistically a genius um, and has something to contribute. So I, I'm not saying, I won't lecture anymore about that, but I am going to be, that's going to be my uh, song for the next two or three years. It's gonna, it's, it's a pretty song. It's going to be Emily, Elise, me. I will say, and there will be time for the audience, I will say we are going to end this meeting at the latest 10 o'clock because um, so the question about whether 
children at TJ should be shuffled around from grade level to grade level. I think if we're concerned about equity and experience, actually, if Memorial doesn't get the opportunity to shuffle, that's, that's a, and maybe for equity purposes, it would make sense to keep TJ kids to have a school within a school effectively and be within a big school, but kind of experience that small group that's farther than most of that. So that would be one argument. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of a house system, I am, me at this point, less wanting to push on the intricacies of how to arrange the houses and more really looking at how to how do we Thank make our middle coming. schools go from um, 40 minute periods to 57 minute periods. That to me seems like a transformative change that's going to really <coughs> help our kids. And I don't know the literature, but my sense from listening to people who do know the literature is that that block drop scheduling has a lot of evidence behind it in terms of promoting students' learning. So flexible scheduling models, and there are a lot of them. Yeah, uh, there's like yeah. all things, there's a lot of different things, but it's really called flexible well, that's the scheduling. Term of the Thank you. Right, the flexible <laughs> scheduling supports um, a great deal, not just academics, but also the social emotional pieces yes. as well. And so when you say that our schedules are now 40 minute periods, and I, want, I now understand my parents are saying that their child is having a tough time middle school they call it like a shuffle but the, just the like being in one room one room one room 40 minutes is impeding the middle school experience from focusing on learning and so that to me is the real goal when we have conversations about middle school where time and energy and resources should be going to plan for that change and maybe get less in the weeds about discussions around details around the house and keep our eyes on the bigger transformative goal that's it um, just on the scheduling thing, there's some, some research that talks about 35 minute uh, periods because the attention span of the students is less and less, so it's harder to keep them for 57 minutes, you know, in, at that age um, in one spot because that's the age where they're, you know, they still need to, yeah, they have to really run around. It's not, right. So that's that's a whole other set of, of, of teaching and, and, and two different and two different, um, you know, courses of action that are both probably have statistics behind them. And you know how we love our metrics. Um, but, but I'm going to agree with um, with Mary um, as far as the rotations go. That when when the middle school first opened, it was 180 days, which is six sets of 30, and there were six rotations that you went through. And the rotations changed by the amount of students um, in the in the grade. So you know, some years there were 25 and seven, and some di some years it was 35 days and five, like five different rotations. And they had things like Latin. Um, like cultural uh, French, cultural Spanish, not language, because then, then you pick language in like seventh grade. So you had like right. a cultural they experience like with like a language. So you would learn like a little bit about the culture of the language, which would make it like easier for you to make the choice of which one you liked better. Um, and again, they had like Latin, they had like science initiative kind of stuff where they did some experiments, um, just as a you know art, music, but but. Um, but like as a rotation, and, and to me, I think it really should be all of what, about um, like the exploration of many different topics. I, you know, I, obviously we have to have English, and that's 180 days. But you know, I think in those other, in that you know the other time period, where, whether it's by choice or by direction, I, I really think that we need to look at. You know, now they have four for like 45 days each, and two of them, you know, one's like really just enrichment math, and one's, it's like an extra English class and an extra math class. It's, you know what I mean? I remember when they were created. They were right. Well, one's music, one's art, one is dynamic applications, which is like a STEM-based course. Yes, yeah, right. It's, but it, but it, it, was, it was really just a way to add math and, and, and more English into, you know, but it wasn't like a journalism English, you know what I mean? Which, which was kind of exciting for them to learn how to be a reporter. You know, you know, and so I, I think that we need to work on that, that the, ex, the experience. It really should be experiential, especially at those ages. So, I love it when I agree with Elise and I agree with Mary. Um, I, I, my school went from 40 minute periods to 57 or 57. Um, right now. Um, and as a teacher, it changed my teaching tremendously, <coughs> that, extra, that extra time. Like, I can't even imagine going back right now. 
Um, but that was a that was a that was a choice because they lost time in other subjects that some some tested subjects, so to speak. Um, as far as heterogeneous grouping, I agree to an extent, and I agree in social studies, I agree in science, I don't necessarily agree with math. And the reason I don't agree with math is because um, it's a different math that the higher level learners learn. Um, maybe sixth grade, I wouldn't do that. But seventh and eighth grade, some of those kids are taking out of the one, some of those kids are taking, and Fairlawn, as opposed to a lot of other towns, some of those kids are taking algebra two. Okay? And then, and then achieving more once they get into high school. There should be a way for kids to move up into it, which I believe there is, and I'm, I'm getting a, there is, mm -hmm. um, but, but you can't, you can't hold those kids back. I can see that. And, and I could see, I could see letting kids try to move up. There's a lot of math teachers that are going to tell you they don't agree with that. I know that because I've talked to them. Um, but, so there should be a way, but you can't not let the kids that, that, are, that are capable of taking Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 not take it because that's, that's going to hold that's basically going to hold them back for the rest of their lives. Basically. I can see that in that, and I would, I would concur with you in that. Um, but that's, just, that's my opinion, and I'm not a math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as, um, as far as the time period, when it's a bigger class period, there is more moving around, and there is more transitioning to other activities. So it's not like they're doing the same thing for... 57, 53 minutes, 57 minutes, because you just can't. I mean, you can't do it with middle school kids. And now that I moved from seventh grade to sixth grade, that's even more. That's even more. So I've seen the development between sixth, seventh, and eighth. And I actually did my student teaching in fifth, so I know, saw a little bit of that. So, um, Jeff. Yeah. Um, back to the math thing. I understand what you're saying about the, the math thing that it could hold people back if they're not, if they're that exceptional by not taking it. Let's just say hypothetically I, I concur with that and we you're kind of make a new plan. I would just ask that if you're going to stick with that, although I still think sixth grade is way too young because it's being decided in fifth grade they're ten years old. Um, I would say that at least let parents and children make that choice to get in there. It's their choice whether they want to go in and parents want to get a tutor for them and for them to have an opportunity. To deny them opportunity, again, based on a rubric that I've never seen, um, I think is really just unfair to people. Um, just a couple of, I got my notes here, I'm sorry. I think the idea of going from 40 to 67 minutes, as we saw earlier today, elementary students do that, uh, teachers, I'm sorry, do that quite easily. I don't see why middle school teachers couldn't do it. Um, I used to teach in 100 minute blocks. When I was in Arizona, I loved it. And going back, because you can get to so many more kids every day. And I think for 57 minutes, that's child's play. I think for a lot of teachers, I really believe a lot of teachers can easily adjust to that. I don't think there's as much training as we think. I think we should give them a little more credit to their professionalism and to their intelligence, because I'm sure they have it. Um, I had one more thing, and I don't know where it went. Um, finally, you know, Mike, I'm sorry for snapping at you earlier. Um, I just felt strongly, so I apologize for that. Um, I do hope, though, in the future that if we could get this beforehand and the board could see this, we would not have to be so confrontational with our questions, that we would have a larger overview of this. So it would make this conversation go more smoothly and would give us the opportunity to really collect our thoughts and to ask questions and have conversations that are more fruitful than you know, people biting at each other when it's unnecessary. Um, 
Ali. <coughs> With, the, with any kind of house system, what happens to um, children that take enriched math and some grade math or eighth grade math and sixth grade? How does that? So again, work? trying to put as many of those courses into each house as possible. So again, you don't want to make one house. These are all the enriched classes. These are, you know, you don't want to identify a house as the enriched house. So. Um, but aren't the kids, I mean, like, let's say in Memorial, there'll be kids taking 8th grade math, kids taking 7th grade math, and kids taking 6th grade math. And that's where sometimes you're going to have that little bit of overlap. Not much in Memorial, because, again, there's only one team, yeah. right? Um, but you could have some of that happening at TJ. Um, we try to keep them as balanced as possible. But uh, it depends on how many sections of each there sure. would be. Um, I think Ron wants to I, I jump just, on there. I can tell you what Ridgewood does. Um, Ridgewood does have the longer periods that the board was just talking about, and they only have enriched math. They don't have the other enriched classes, and for the enriched math, they mix houses. So that, that way, um, that's the way that they're able to staff it. My school, we call that cross team. Cross team. Cross team. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you, someone that teaches a bunch of kids that are cross team, I, I don't like it. I don't like teaching kids that are cross team. I mean, I like teaching the kids, but I don't like. As a matter of fact, some of my cross team kids are really good, um, but it's harder to get. Then I have to go to the other team when I when I have a you know a, um, an issue that I want to discuss. So that's the only, that's the only problem. Did you have that? Yes. Um, I understand that it takes time for the transition to actually go into the house model, but. You guys have done the research before, and we kind of voted on that option and to do the house. But and and it, moving from forty to fifty-seven doesn't sound like. Can't we do it faster? Why do we have to? Because if it's you're picking, if you're doing a house for six, you're necessarily creating a house for seven and for eight because you're using the, the teachers. Can't you? I don't know. And we have plenty of time. So, it doesn't well, seem this is one issue out of very many that we're all working on right now, and it really does take a good deal of time. Um, it, it's a tremendous amount of work um, because it has to do with staffing, and it has to do with certifications, and it has to do with curriculum, and it has to do with scheduling. And, and we've spent seven meetings so far just trying to get up to a certain point. There are so many intricacies that don't that you don't see on the surface, but when you are involved, there are a ton of intricacies that make it extremely time consuming. And again, if we're going to do this, we want to do it right. We certainly don't want to jump into it and put something in place and find out that it's going to be a big flop. And so there's there's plenty of stuff that we have to do um, where we have to figure out a lot of different issues. We also have contractual issues we have to consider. There are many, many different pieces of this puzzle that have to come together. But we're not doing it right. We're doing it in pieces. So we're only doing half of it. That's not how it's going to be in the future. So we're, we're not doing it right. We're doing it halfway. And for me, I feel that if, if you put the puzzle pieces for the six, then you have the rest of the puzzles for seven and eight. Everything will just come into place once you play with the puzzle. Because you block the six greater teachers and then with the houses. Again, I know I understand we all want to make it right, but we're not making it right. We're just making it partial. So it's even if the we can, yeah, it's the best that we can do right now. Yeah. It's also room usage, and room utilization. There's actually there's, there's, a lot. there's a lot that go into it. The one thing I always keep in my mind when we get into these topics that, that take quite a bit of time, and, and I sometimes I think the same way you do, and then I turn back and say, but wait a second, at the same time as all this is going on and all these people are working on this, school is going on. So it's not like they have a lot of free time to begin with. This is just an added <coughs> responsibility, and it's and it's sometimes it does take time. And I have to say something. Since I've been on the board, the one thing I think I've been most proud of about Fairlawn is not just jumping into something without.
training our teachers, training, making sure it's going to work ahead of time, doing all the research. We we don't do that when it comes to when it comes to the school programs in our schools, and we're successful because of it. Because despite everything, despite the overcrowdedness, and we're very very according to the state. We're a highly successful school district, and we match up, and because of our teachers, I, I honestly think, we match up with a lot of the higher um, district factor school, uh, school districts around here, around Bergen County. And, so, and, yeah. and, sorry, and, and we're not done, and we're still working on it, and we're meeting again this week on it as well. So, I mean, I cannot tell you how much time has got into this process and the time where we spent working on something and saying, you know what, we need to scrap that whole idea, even though we spent hours and hours, because it's not right. And let's start all over again. So I can't tell you the countless amount of hours that we put in and the countless amount of people, teachers, Dawn, Liliana, uh, union representation, administrators, supervisors, principals, 20 of us in this room, putting our heads together so it's not a top-down approach. So that's a very multidisciplinary approach and collaborative approach. So we can sit there and work on it together. So we can make sure that we're meeting the needs of everybody with the, with this plan that we're doing. So I I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. But it's just this is a step in the right direction. It's it's this is this is good stuff. I just add. Um, I understand now the more transformational changes, like with the scheduling, making periods of forty minutes to fifty seven minutes, that you need to really have. A period of planning to implement that change, but I think it with the institution of teams, two teams per grade level and TJ to one team per grade level memorial. If you find that as you're shuffling around staff to accommodate the changes in the sixth grade, and that like let's say the conversations with the union rep you have for the sixth grade, so it applies to seventh eighth grade. If it comes, if the puzzle pieces come together more quickly for. I feel yeah. just don't hold yeah. yourself back from sticking to We are not. I guarantee yeah. we are not. Why did you even say that? Why did you even say that? Well, I think it's important to the public. Like, if that ends up happening, to say. Absolutely. And, and the same thing, you know, when we go back to that advisory piece. And we've been talking about advisory and talking about how great that is. Would we be able to have something in place at some point next year? I don't know. But I think we're definitely having conversations about yeah. it next year. Yeah. I don't want you talking about how we that would, works. You know, we're all for it if we get there. We're excited. Yeah. We see something. Oh, this is great! I mean, we literally took three people and just locked them in a room and they said, "You guys figure this out," because they did such great energy moving forward about it. I mean, so no, we're we're going to strike while the iron's hot if we can. Other last comments from the audience? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, you were waiting for a while. That's a long. <laughs> so um, I was just sort of looking at the question that's up on, on the board there, what do you value in a house system? And looking ahead at moving the fifth grade in, I'm wondering if um, there are thoughts or will be thoughts about how we can take advantage of some of the programs that wouldn't have particularly been available to the fifth grade in the elementary school. Yes. And then you mentioned enrichment. So I just want to sort of throw that out there, is that maybe the fifth grade have accessibility if, if possible, to those kinds of opportunities. Absolutely, and I think that we all agree that one of the exciting pieces about having our fifth graders in the middle schools is opening up opportunities for them, whether it's academic choices um, in, the, in the middle school, but also extracurricular choices. I, I think that they are going to have a much more enriched experience, and I don't necessarily think it's going to look exactly like our sixth grade or our seventh grade or our eighth grade right now looks. Um, I do envision fifth grade is a transition year that just because they're in a building called a middle school doesn't mean we have to treat them like all of the other middle schoolers that are in that building. We have the availability to create whatever kind of a structure we want in the fifth grade or the sixth grade. So, you know, so I think it's exciting for us to think what is appropriate for our fifth grade students within this middle school building. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Cindy. Um, I, I did want to say that I think that um, the administration and the board is very cognizant of the fact that we're not just moving people out of the, the elementary school to create space and just dumping them there, that any opportunity that we can give them to excel um, is going to be done. And um, that's one of my, that's one of the things that I'm excited about is to see the opportunities that 
that will go to those fifth graders without throwing them in a in a in a pot, but to transition them in, but giving them more than they would possibly be able to get in the elementary school setting. Here's a, here's an interesting thing, but it's funny because the older kids have lockers in some of the in some of the elementary schools. My school doesn't have lockers for fifth graders. They have uh, space in the room to keep their stuff because so they don't get that they don't get that sixth grade locker experience mm -hmm. until sixth grade. And, and so so it's just an exam. It's just like. Something but these like are all little pieces, though, that the kids especially get anxious about. And one of the buildings, uh, one of the school districts we visited, and I don't remember which one it was, they had lockers, but they were inside the classroom. Right. So they had the locker experience, but not out in the hallway. So, you know, it, it's just sort of how it's structured in, in all the different buildings. And who knows if they do? Did they have locks on the lockers? Because they might not have. That, that's why they were in the classroom. It could be, yeah. Um, Dr. Plus. Well, one of the, and we have five minutes. And one of the stop. things that I say to my administrative that team clock and the board, <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> oh, it really is. <laughs> it does drive people crazy. You know, I, I say, I say to folks, I have two minutes. I say to folks that the more important the decision is, the slower we should go. Now, that doesn't mean to be paralyzed, but. All of the concepts that we have talked about require preparation and training. I was in one district that was one of the pioneers in New Jersey with alternating drop schedules, A and B schedules. It took two years of ED before we even started it. And we had people piloting it. And then we, after a while, we got so good that we were training other schools. But there is such a thing as making sure we have our homework done, building the foundation, so that we can innovate on top of that. There's always a sense of urgency, and I understand that, but we need to make sure before we do something that we're ready to do that which we want to do. And one last thing. I do have yeah, an that's article. 30 seconds. Of, of I'm sorry, oh, come I need on. 10. <laughs> um, I have an article, um, if you're interested. It's a, a historical overview of the middle school movement from the 1960s until the present. So it sort of talks to you about the different components of a middle school and what makes a middle school so unique. Um, but it also talks about how it's sort of um, morphed over the years and, and sort of what the focus has been. So I thought that you might find it. Interesting to take a look at. It's long. It's about 28 pages. Housekeeping announcement. You met? I got one also. All right. Uh, Wednesday is the um, budget work session. It's the snowstorm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the rain. No. The rain date will be Thursday. <laughs> Okay. If there is a rain date, it'll be Thursday, and I think uh, Brooke is going to advertise that. And I'll put something out on Facebook. You know, if there's a problem with Wednesday, it's going to be Thursday because we have to vote on it preliminary I will, budget I, I on Wednesday. I will tell you I cannot. Okay. Is it the same time, 7.30? Same time. Same time. Yeah, so I, that, was it, that was it. I just want to end with it. Just, just so the public knows, on April 16th, um, I will be opening up the shared services meeting with the town council. I, I will be asking that um, earlier if the people on that committee could meet about half hour, 45 minutes prior to the council coming, if that part is allowed to be closed. And then when the council comes, I do want to open that up publicly and hopefully that camera can be here too. Thank you. you want the camera? I want the camera. It's not work. Okay. Brooke, we want the camera. Not She's here. not here. <laughs> email, like friends. We'll, we'll, her. Her. we'll tell her. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Last Peace. last call. We're adjourned. You know. And a one.